Okay, John, we're live, so you can start the meeting when you're ready. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. And uh, good afternoon and welcome to a virtual meeting of the Audit Committee at the London Borough of Hillingdon. This virtual meeting is also being broadcast simultaneously on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon London. The purpose of this committee is to review and monitor the Council's audit, governance, risk management framework and financial and non-financial performance, as well as overseeing the financial reporting process of the Statement of Accounts. My name is John Cheshire and I am the chairman of this meeting. Uh, we'll start with some online housekeeping as usual, please. Before we start, some important... Um, housekeeping matters for everyone present. Can we please ensure that any mobile phones around you are on silent? Please keep your microphone muted when not speaking and then unmute to speak. And as chairman, I will call on those to speak during the meeting. In terms of technical meeting control, if any councillor leaves the virtual meeting partway through for a period of time, for example, through a lost connection, then I'll continue the meeting unless we're not core. And I think we've just got four uh, members here today uh, in total. So we will pause until connectivity uh, is restored. Before we move on to the agenda, I'd like to do a roll call of the councillors and others present to confirm attendance. Please indicate you are present when I say your name. Councillor Flynn. Present, Chairman. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Councillor Eggington. I'm present. I've got a declaration as a retired member of the pension fund. Lovely. Thank you very much uh, for that. And Councillor Graham. Yes. Present Chairman, thank you. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. And please can I ask that officers confirm their attendance when I read out their names. Paul Waymond, Corporate Director of Finance. Present Chairman. Thanks Paul. Muir Lowry, Deputy Director of Exchequer Services and Business Assurance. Present Chairman. Thank you Muir. Sarah Hydry, Head of Internal Audit and Risk Assurance. Present Chairman. Thanks Sarah. Zach O'Neill, Head of Counter Fraud, uh, attending his last meeting with us. Present Chairman. Thank you very much, Zach. Um, Alex Brown, Interim Head of Counter Fraud. Good to see you, Alex. Thank you, and Present Chairman. Lovely. Great. Uh, Stephanie Rao, Risk and Insurance Manager. Present Chairman. Thanks, Stephanie. James Lake, Chief Accountant. Present Chairman. Thanks, James. Uh, Steve Clark, Democratic Services Officer. Present, Chairman. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Suresh Patel, Ernst & Young. Present, Chair. Thanks, Suresh. Nice to see you as well. Look, uh, Thomason Aliu, Ernst & Young. Present, Chair. Hiya. And Larissa Midoni, Ernst & Young. Uh, present, Chairman. Lovely. Thank you very much uh, indeed. And uh, good to see you all uh, again uh, as usual. Um, we'll new, now move on to the agenda and um, agenda item uh, or part one rather is the, the, the public uh, items uh, of the agenda. Um, as you know, we take those before we move uh, to part two uh, under private meeting. So agenda item one, apologies for, for absence. We've received apologies for absence from Councillor Mills for this evening's meeting. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, Agenda item two, declarations of interest. We, we've had one declaration of interest. Were, were there any other declarations of interest in matters before this meeting? No. Sorry, Chair, would you remind if, um, uh, would you mind if Councillor Agginson just repeats his uh, declaration for, for myself? Cer certainly. Yes, um, I've got a declaration as a retired member of the Local Government Pension Scheme. Perfect, thank you. Apologies for the dog, which is howling in the background, if you can hear it. But. No trouble at all. Um, agenda item three, to confirm the reports in private and in public on this agenda. Items one to 12 are in part one and will therefore be considered in public. Item 13 is, is in part two and will be considered uh, in private. Agenda item four is to receive and agree to the minutes uh, of the last meeting. And uh, I'll, I'll take the meeting, the, the meeting minutes as agreed, unless there are any comments. OK, so thank you very much. That's the, the minutes from last time uh, agreed. 
Okay. Um, the next agenda item is agenda item five, which is the EY 2020 to 2021 annual audit plan and pension fund audit plan. And uh, James, I think you're going to introduce this for us as, as usual. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report introduces the EY 2021 audit plans. Um, there are two plans produced, one for the council and another for the pension fund. They highlight the key areas of focus and where EY see significant risks. They also give materiality limits, the timeline and proposed costs. Uh, this year we're aiming to have the draft accounts ready by the end of June and have the audit completed and signed off at the 29th of September audit committee. I would also like to highlight there is a new process regarding value for money this year. So which subject to receiving guidance, EY are hopefully in a position to provide an update at this meeting. Um, that's it from me. So with that, if I may chair, I'll pass over to Suresh at EY to introduce and elaborate on their plans, if I may. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. Thank you, James, and uh, good afternoon to members of the committee. So I'm gonna just give you a quick uh, overall kind of introduction to both of the plans before I hand over to Larissa who's going to take you through the key areas of the council plan and then we'll take the pension fund uh, as well chair and um, Tom is just going to pull out the key messages from the pension fund plan and then I'll come back to value for money timing and fees so I think just in terms of overall context it's probably worthwhile considering that this financial year so 2021 is the year that we are all seeing the actual impact of COVID in the actual accounts. So if you remember last year's audit and accounts, obviously COVID landed just before the year end. So actual impact in terms of things like obviously the funding you've now received from, from central government, loss of income that you've incurred and the compensation that you've claimed is clearly now going to feature in this year's account. So, so you will see some additional risks in our audit plan, which Larissa will shortly explain. And those risks aren't unique to Hillingdon. They are pretty common to local authorities up and down the country and, and across London. It's also worthwhile considering that there is the remains a significant amount of pressure in the system in terms of financial reporting. So both in terms of accounts preparers and auditors. And, and James has mentioned that you know you're aiming for an end of June to prepare your draft accounts. So made CLG has recently issued, or more than recently now, issued their timetable for accounts, which does give you to the end, of, well, to the 1st of August, actually, to draft your accounts, which obviously is recognition of that pressure. But um, unfortunately, it doesn't give the auditors any any longer than the end of September. But as, as James said, we are planning to do your audit by the end of September. But I think there's a recognition that the, there is pressure in the system. And, there is, a, there is a little bit of a backlog still for 1920, so there are still a number of local authorities who have yet to publish their audited 1920 accounts. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the plans that you've got in front of you, we've labelled outline, because when we were drafting them, we hadn't finished our detailed planning. That is almost complete now, so uh, we will be in a position in the next few weeks to conclude on our planning, but that doesn't change anything that's in your plans. And as and as James said, uh, this is a new code of audit practice, and I'll, I'll explain a bit more about the value for money work. But it's also as a new as a revision to an accounting, so sorry, an auditing standard around accounting estimates, which does have an impact, which Larissa will also touch on. So let me hand over to Larissa to talk you through the council plan. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Suresh. Um, so I'd like to take everybody to page 15 of the agenda pack, um, and that's page 21 of the PDF if you're using the electronic version. And I'm going to outline the uh, major risks we identified and highlight the differences compared to prior years. Um, if we start from the top, the, the first two risks are consistent with prior year and they are in response to ISA 240 requirements um, with regard to our responsibilities to identify um, fraud and report on, in, uh, with regards to the financial statements. Uh, we have a new risk, uh, number three, accounting adjustments made in the movement in reserve statement. Um, this was in the context of COVID-19 that we um, we assessed that there is a risk um, when recording adjustments between accounting basis and um, financing uh, basis, uh, which could impact the general fund. Um, and we, we highlighted this as a, as a new risk in our audit plan. There's more information on the kinds of adjustments that um, 
play a role in, in this risk in section two of this report. Uh, the following risk is with regards to the various um, uh, COVID related funding that the Council has received during 2021. Uh, and this is um, in relation to the accounting treatment uh, of principles, uh, principal versus agent um, and also uh, any existing criteria uh, that could impact on the timing of the recognition of the grants. Again, more details on this in, in section uh, two of this report. The, the following one is uh, a risk consistent with prior year, um, and you will know that uh, in the prior year there was a difference, a judgmental difference um, on the valuation of uh, schools, land and buildings, and we are currently in communication with management uh, and external evaluators engaged by the Council um, to find a way to mitigate those differences. Uh, moving on to the following page. IS-19 valuations is consistent with prior year, um, no change there. Consideration of group boundary, uh, we, we reassess every year the materiality of the subsidiary Healing, Healingdon First Limited. Um, and currently we don't expect there to be um, a trigger for preparation of group accounts. However, that has not, uh, the, the assessment has still, uh, is still to take place from our side. Uh, the following risk is uh, again consistent with prior year and just as a reminder uh, we're not challenging the going concern of the council we are however um, challenging the uh, financial resilience assessment uh, and the relevant disclosures in the accounts the following is um, uh, again a risk consistent with prior year um, uh, we, we have a narrow focus on valuation of um, PP, specifically council dwellings and other land and buildings due to the estimates involved. And the last one is a new area of focus. However, uh, we are aware of uh, significant changes in circumstances with regards to NDR um, appeals. So once more information becomes available from, from the government, we will take that into account and this might change uh, in the audit plan. We will inform the council um, and the, the audit committee uh, in due course. Moving to the following page, uh, just a brief summary on our materiality. The basis and the range uh, is consistent with prior year. The figures are based on prior figures uh, and the amounts will change as the accounts um, for 2021 become available to us. Uh, the last point I'd like to make is with regards to the um, a change in the um, uh, auditing standard for accounting estimates, I said five, uh, 540, and there has been a change in, in uh, the expectations from auditors um, in our process of <clears throat> identifying and assessing and responding to those r uh, risks around estimates. And the change in the standard might affect the nature and extent of information that we may request uh, and will likely increase in the level of work required from us. And at this stage, I'll hand back to Suresh. I'll just, yeah, like Tom is in to talk you through the, the risks in the pension fund plan, and then I'll come back to value for money, timing, and fees. Tom is in. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <coughs> the plan Hi. for the, oh, <laughs> the audit plan for the pension fund starts on page 55. That's page 61 of the PDF. And I'll briefly talk through the audit risks and the materiality. So starting off with the audit risk on page 59, again, this is page 65 of the PDF. There are no new risks or areas of focus for 2021, and all of the identified risks are in line with previous years. There are two fraud risks. The first is the general risk of misstatement due to fraud or error. And then there is a specific fraud risk which covers journals. This is the risk that incorrect journals may be posted which will then misstate the investment balance or and the investment income balance as well. There is a significant risk which relates to the valuation of unquoted or level three investments. This, inv this assets are more difficult to value as there is no active market and one or more inputs used in the valuation uh, are based on unobservable market information, thus making it more judgmental and complex to value. 
In 1920s in Praia, there were a few transfers of investments into level three. And this was about 165 million of property investments which were moved into level three. And this was due to the increased market volatility and uncertainty brought on by COVID. So in summary, these assets are more complex to value. And even a slight change in the inputs or assumptions can lead to a material impact on the financial statements. And they're also sizable. They make up about 28% of the total assets, total net assets. So we've assessed the valuation of this to be a significant risk. Uh, there is the inherent risk surrounding the disclosures and going concern. As Larissa has stated, uh, this risk is not about the going concern status of the pension fund, but rather about the required going concern disclosures. So just like the borough, the fund is required to produce a comprehensive assessment of its going concern, including a cash flow forecast, and then make a relevant disclosure in line with the assessment, making sure that any uncertainties are highlighted. Finally, we have the risk surrounding the IS-26 disclosure. Now, we've always done work on this disclosure, but in the past, we've just not included it in the plan. So it's a new inclusion in the audit plan, but not a new area of focus in itself. Uh, this, risk, sorry, this, risk, this risk surrounds the present value of the retirement benefits liability. It is a material figure, about 1.5 billion, and it is subject to complex ex estimation by the actuary as there is the, always the risk that the actuary might use inappropriate assumptions. So this is uh, an area of focus. Moving on to the next page, which shows our materiality. Once again, there is no change in our materiality basis. The planning materiality is based on 1% of 1920s net assets, and the performance materiality is based on 75% of the planning materiality. And the audit differences is based on 5% of the planning materiality. And this is the threshold over which we will report all uncorrected misstatements to the audit committee. Thank you. OK, let me just quickly take you back then to value for money in the council plan, which is on your page 31 of the pack. Uh, I think we've, we've we've I've trailed this before in terms of changes to the new to the code, but but essentially we've now got three reporting criteria which are similar to the previous reporting criteria but have got some some differences which um which mainly kind of focus around the f financial sustainability rather than financial resilience and um the, the main change in the code is actually on the reporting side of things so previously we would issue a conclusion on your value for money, value for money arrangements as part of issuing the opinion on the accounts but now under the code we no longer issue a conclusion uh, if we identify significant weaknesses in your arrangements, we report those in that audit opinion. But if we don't identify any significant weaknesses, then we don't have anything to report. So we're, we're silent on that in the audit opinion. What we then are required to do, though, is issue a commentary against each of those reporting criteria. Uh, so each of those reporting criteria have four or five what's called proper arrangements behind them. Uh, and we assess your uh, your arrangements against what the expectations are outlined in those reporting criteria and we report those in, in detail to the committee. We're, we're currently kind of drafting a sort of template in terms of that commentary. Uh, that will be either coming to your September committee or or the one after because it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be reported at the same time as we issue an opinion on your accounts. Uh, I've highlighted in on page 33 that whilst we have yet to complete detailed planning on value for money it's likely that we are we will be doing some additional work around financial sustainability um, in light of obviously the financial uh, challenges that the council like many other councils are facing so that that's vfm uh, on, on fees you'll see in both plans we've included a detailed table on on fees uh, we're obviously keen to be transparent on the additional areas of work that we needed to carry out and provide them where we can a range of additional fees to enable you to obviously form a view on those. Um, I should say that we are still waiting for PSAA to determine our proposal around increasing the base fee 
and we're also awaiting PSA to determine the additional fees from the 1920 audit. They, they do like to take their time. So that is still in progress, but we've included both those in the plans for, for your um, just for your information. And then finally, on timing, as, as, as James said, so you're, you're planning to get your draft accounts done by the end of June. We've got our resources booked in for July and August to complete the audit with a view to um, being able to certify your account by at, at pretty much afterwards, um, your 29th of September committee. So that's a pretty good position to be in. And that obviously is consistent with prior years, but I think through the effective uh, working joint working that we have with particularly the finance team and the council that we're able to deliver to these quite challenging timescales. I know we've taken you for quite a lot of detail there chair but we're obviously happy to take any questions. No that's great thank you very much indeed and uh, no I appreciate the briefing uh, from each of you. Um, before I, I ask any questions um, Colleagues, committee members, um, any areas that you'd like to explore further uh, with EY? Uh, Councillor Eggington, I can see your hand and apologies. I, on my screen, I, have, I can't see everybody. So let's go through in order. We'll, Councillor Eggington to begin with uh, and then I'll, I'll ask colleagues. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, it you. was really to do with the new risk significant, oh, sorry, the Let's go back to the right place. Um, it was to do with the movement of res in reserve statement. Um, I wasn't quite sure why um, you mentioned that the COVID was a, a, a higher risk, um, but I wasn't quite clear as to how that arises, how much greater it is this year than last. Um, and the other one was to do with the valuation of the school buildings. Um, and whether you've had any progress in, because I know that there was a problem with the 2020 accounts, um, whether any progress has been made in resolving the, the differences between the two valuations. OK, thank you, Councillor. I think they're, they're fair questions. I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with both of them, but I'm pretty sure Larissa can come in and provide a bit more detail. On the on the MERS risk, it's a fair, it's a fair comment in terms of why we're now in pretty much enhancing that risk and it, and it is because this is the year that like I said the COVID is, is significantly impacting the authority and and actually from a from an audit perspective um, there's only a couple of ways really that a local authority can manipulate their accounts and, and, and MERS is one of those as well as the inappropriate capitalization so so it's a recognition that we think this year there is a, there's more pressure potential to do that and that actually that, that's that's the judgment that we're making across a number of local authorities this year um, I'll, I'll, Larissa can come back with more detail if she's got any. And on the skills of value, I think, yeah, Larissa, you, you, you were talking about the fact that we have already been engaging, haven't you, with with, um, with the council's valuers and our own valuers. Uh, yes, Suresh, that's correct with regards to the prior year um, issues or let's call them differences in um, uh, estimates. Uh, we reached some common ground on certain items uh, and we're still working through a few more. But um, we, at this point in time, we expect that the uh, largest, the, the issues that were driving the largest difference uh, have been sorted um, and we'll be able to confirm once our experts will have a look um, at the results, uh, at the values results this year. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Eggington, um, any, any other questions or further clarifications that you require there? Yeah, yes, there was one, and I'm not sure whether it cover, is covered within the value um, for money basis. Um, I don't, you're probably aware, uh, Suresh, that the council gives a discount or has given a discount to elderly people like me. Um, in our council tax. Um, the basis of, on which that was done was that all elderly people were entitled to it. Um, presumably because as a group, we're obviously impoverished and we can't afford council tax, even if we're in a band F or G or whatever to operate. Anyway, that's aside, the, the, rules of, the rule of the discount has now changed in that it's only available to elderly people who have previously had it. And I wondered whether that 
is compliance with the law. Um, I make a declaration of interest that I get it. So, uh, but um, I just wonder whether it, it's uh, legal to do that on the basis that I'm not sure that the people now entitled to it um, are different from the people who are now 65 and would otherwise be entitled to it, but aren't because either they've moved or they um, just because they've only just got to 65. It's just an interesting point, and I don't know whether that bearing in mind that it is council money which is being provided for this discount. So um, that's obviously quite a detailed aspect of council. Yeah, I wasn't expecting an immediate yeah. response, sorry. Sorry about the dog. <laughs> So yeah, we, I mean, it would be something obviously we'd consider in a round as part of uh, considering if, if it's a big financial hit on the council to, to, to make that decision to do that. Um, but it won't be something necessarily that we would be looking out for in terms of is it lawful to do that unless we are aware that there is particular requirements around it. But now we're aware of it, obviously we will ask the question. Thank you. Thank you very much in, indeed. Um, Councillor Flynn, did you have any questions or observations? No, um, Mr Chairman, I'm quite happy actually with this report. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. Councillor Graham. Yes, Chairman, um, I'm going to show my ignorance here, I think, but on the bottom of page seven, it talks about other areas of audit focus not classified as significant risk, and it talks about consideration of group I'm not too clear what all that means. Could someone just briefly explain what the connection is, uh, Hillingdon First Limited? So, um, you, yeah, because you've got a, you, you own that entity. Uh, if that entity is material, is, is a significant value, then you should, in effect, include that in a set, what's called a consolidate. You should consolidate their accounts into your into the council's account and prepare what's called a set of group accounts because you in effect are a group of entities so the council and its subsidiary so a number of local authorities have have companies like like you have uh, some have companies that are significant in size so they actually then consolidate the activity of that entity into its into the councils and prepare group accounts which obviously then require uh, additional disclosures and additional audit work so it's quite a key judgment that you make about whether or not you should consolidate Hillingdon first limited but it's largely driven by um, value but it can be driven by risk if there's a particular risk associated to that company so you make that judgment thank you. assessment yeah thank you thank you for that explanation thank you chair thank you very much uh, councillor graham um suresh j just a couple of questions uh from from me if you if you don't mind um the September 2021 target date, um, given that, um, you know, the COVID situation is a little bit more complex as you've um, identified uh, through the accounts uh, in the period that we're talking about. Um, and very hard to predict, I suppose, so far ahead. But, you know, with a fair wind, is that end of September target date achievable? I know you sort of caveat the report in a couple of places saying it's it's going to be a bit tight yeah i think well i think for hillingdon it is achievable based on yeah. our record you know in the past of working with the council and we've put in place sufficient resources and actually we've given ourselves the, both the councillors and, and us obviously a bit of a uh, bit of leeway at the end because we're hoping mm -hmm. to finish the audit by probably you know end of august early september so we've still mm -hmm. got a few weeks before the committee okay thank you for that um the next sort of question may be one for, for James or for Paul rather than you, you Suresh, but it, it has come through as one of the, the risks that you're, you're interested in this time. Uh, and that's the movement in, re, in reserve statement. Uh, I suppose as, as Audit Committee Chair, I, I, I sort of, I suppose my, my point is, can I have some assurance from, from James or from Paul um, that we've been treating um, the accounting adjustments appropriately in, the, in this area? Is this something you're, you're comfortable with? 
I can say from from my perspective, obviously that the, the the team, the finance team, follow the the rules and regulations. So that you know, and part of the one of the other risks is the management override. So that's all taken into consideration. So we're 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 following the rules as normal and following the the accounting concepts from that perspective. So yeah, there's there's no pressure on us or any reason why we would do that. Wonderful. Uh, that's the assurance I, I, I love, love to hear. The grant situation, though, that's a little bit complex, and, and that was another new area of risk um, for EY to focus on this time. Um, you know, I, I guess that's been a challenge working through the different um, requirements in respect of each of the different areas of grants. Yeah, we've, we've, the, the concept is, is it our money or are we just passporting it on to somebody else? So therefore, we shouldn't be including it in the accounts. So the, the team who look after those grants have been doing an assessment on a sort of grant by grant basis um, as to whether they're principal or agent. And therefore, and there's a, 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 a we've discussed the rationale with EY on all of those grants, and we will continue to do that as part of the, the assessment. But yeah, they're all being looked at on an individual grant by grant basis to assess the correct treatment. So that's been done as a specific piece of work. OK, L lovely. Thank you. Um, the next sort of point I wanted to make could be me making a mistake, but I'm not 100 percent sure it is. Um, at the bottom of the, that same page where we talk about valuations of schools, land uh, and buildings um, in the uh, EY details uh, section, uh, Surash, mm -hmm. um, we say there that the, the value of secondary schools was understated by 4.2 million in the council's financial statements. Later on in the report where we look at that risk in, in more detail, um, which I think is on page 25 of the printed pack, page 15 of the EY pack, there we say um, in the what is the risk section, uh, the value of secondary schools was overstated by approximately four million uh, in the financial statements. So one of them needs correcting, I think, unless I've got it wrong. No, I think that's a good spot, Chair. Just showing that I'd read read through it all. Look, it does, and we'll we will correct whichever one is misstated. Thank uh, you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have no further uh, questions. Um, I think, as you said in your um, overview, Suresh, you know, you've been transparent in terms of how you've uh, reported the areas of risk, the fees, the materiality uh, thresholds for both the council and the pension fund. Um, I'm I'm happy with the, um, the the plan that you presented here today. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, e e y uh, for for the briefing and uh, for the heads up on on all of that. Thank you. Uh, if we proceed through then to agenda item six, which is the e y update on the 2019-20 housing benefit assurance uh, process. Uh, James, to start. Thank you, Chair. Again, I'll, I'll just give a, a quick brief introduction. So this report gives an update on the 1920 certification and focuses on the housing benefit assurance process or the HPAP as it's known. So the HPAP was completed by the deadline on the 31st of January and resulted in only one immaterial error of £18 being identified. So due to the complexity and number of transactions in this area, this is considered an excellent result this year or last year. Uh, from completion, from a certification perspective, um, just to wrap it all up, the teacher's pension was also submitted in December 2020 and the capital receipts pooling was completed by the 31st of March 2021. So from a, a certifications perspective, this brings all of 1920 external audit uh, work to a close. So if I may, um, I can pa I'll pass over to Suresh now just to see if he's got any further detail to add. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, just, just to kind of reiterate what James said there, actually, that in terms of the housing benefits work in particular, and again, I think that's a sort of testament to the cooperation and collaborative approach we've got, that, that there wasn't many councils who had their housing benefits claims certified by the end of January. Um, indeed, I've still got about six or seven that I'm looking at at the moment. So, um, you know, that, that again, you know, the, the, and, and the housing benefits requires a lot of planning and organisation and, like I say, a lot of cooperation. So, that is that is testament to that that joint working approach. So we're, we're we're pleased to be able to be able to do that. The detail of the report, you know, is a bit baffling, I imagine. So, but what James said is is is, is right in terms of it's a very positive outcome. Uh, there's no materiality on this work, hence the reason why we reported 18 pounds. 
which I know sounds ridiculous, but that's what the DWP want. Um, and uh, and we only look at a small, obviously, number of cases, but there's a very good outcome. And similar with the teachers' pensions and the pooling of capital receipts, again, the fact that we've been able to do that in a timely manner um, is, is, is really uh, indicative of good, good working papers and knowledge at the council. That's good. all I wanted to say, Chair. Lovely, thank you very much indeed, and um, you know, well done to to, to both uh, officers and to EY for for cracking on and getting this done in the time that you have uh, had for this. Um, Councillor Eginton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, it's just really a, a question. Obviously, it is quite a lot of work which is involved, and does internal audit do any help? Or because I'm not sure that. I've ever seen, very, well, I've seen some reports from, from the internal audit, I think, over the years um, relating to housing benefit. But it seems to me that bearing in mind that these are very small amounts and the huge amount of, of transactions, whether the, there's any help which internal audit could do to, um, to reduce the cost to the council. Yeah. So, so DWP are pretty prescriptive on the approach that, and we're actually called reporting accountants when we do this work because it's not an audit and um, the council actually carry out a lot of initial what's called initial testing themselves so and the, what's called 40 plus so where we identify areas is the council who actually carries out that testing and then we sample test it I mean an inter internal audit can come in you know and, and give you their side but I suspect because I don't know many any councils who use internal audit to do that initial testing because of the complexities of the cases involved you, you know you really need to be an experienced housing benefit, um, uh, you know, assessor to be able to do the work that need because you then document it in a quite detailed workbook as well. So it is quite specialist, I would say, in terms of being able to do that work. But uh, and I've never seen internal audit do that at other councils. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions, Councillor Flynn? Not, <clears throat> not a no. question. Just to say, it's quite remarkable to get that close. I'd have thought to eighteen pounds. It's uh, <laughs> a great tribute, I think, to all the uh, all of those uh, people, both E and Y, E and Y, and uh, elsewhere, who were involved in this. So, uh, just really thank you for all your hard work, and uh, hopefully presents a challenge for the next year to get even nearer to, uh, uh, you know, breaking you know, a balance of zero, essentially. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Graham. Well, I, I would just uh, reflect exactly what uh, Councillor Flynn has just said. Nothing more to add. Uh, lovely. Thank you very much, Councillor Graham. I can see a hand raised, but I can't see S Sarah. Did it you is, want to sorry. come in on the, um, on the internal audit point? I did. Um, just wanted to say that we assist EY um, every year in the summer. We tend to review uh, the workbook and modules for um, non-HRA cell 11 and rent allowances um, cell 94. Um, and we do an annual review of that um, with the uh, accountants. So we take the cases and workbooks from the housing benefit team and then we do verification checks to make sure that they comply with all the DWP requirements. And then EY use that exercise to um, build assurance and then certify as well. Um, they're part of the review and checks. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. that. That's helpful. Obviously, I'm horrified that there was an overpayment of £18 on one of the um, cases that you, you examined. We must try harder to ensure that uh, there is no such repeat next year. No, joking aside, thank you very much. That's, that's great. Congratulations to all of those uh, involved in, in this process. Thank you. Um, OK, if there's no further questions will move forward. So agenda item seven, uh, and thank you very much Suresh and the team uh, for the reporting today, uh, appreciated. Thank you. Agenda item seven, internal audit progress report for Q4 2020 to 2021, including the Q1 2021 to 2022, see I managed to say it properly this, this month, um, internal audit plan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so this presentation refers to agenda item seven of your papers um, and refers to the um, internal audit work carried out in quarter four, 2021. Um, this quarter, we've seen the team make good progress with the internal audit plan. 
um, with all reviews underway um, since the last internal audit progress report to CMT and Audit Committee, um, which was dated the 4th of January. Um, eight assurance reviews have concluded, one consultancy review has been completed and five grant claims have been certified. Um, you will note in the papers that we've issued um, three assurance reviews with limited audit opinions. Uh, they are the estates, cemeteries, education, health and care plans and local offer. Um, the details of each of those are on page 103 of your papers. You'll also um, see that the progress report contains um, details about the follow up exercise uh, that we've been uh, carrying out following the revised process. Um, this is on sections 3.4 and pages 104 and 105 um, and also Appendix D of your papers. Um, and that contains a breakdown of all the high and medium risks um, that have been um, so, uh, so high, sorry, high and medium recommendations that have been outstanding and the updates from action owners. Um, the majority of these recommendations have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic um, and we're working through the outstanding recommendations and have assigned resource to assist with their closure. Um, but we'll continue to progress uh, with this work and report our progress to the audit committee every quarter. Um, one of the last areas of the report I just want to draw your attention to was the um, KPIs on page 105 and 106. Um, you will note that KPIs 5 and 6 both showed an improvement from Q3 but did not meet their respective targets. Um, they both refer to the production of draft and final reports by the end of March 2021, um, which has been impacted by the pandemic, but we'll continue to want it to progress against these in the next financial year with the aim of achieving them next year. Um, Appendix C um, on pages 111 to 114 um, contains the 21-22 quarter one plan, which is presented for your approval. Um, there's no other matters to bring to your attention at this time, but happy to answer any questions. Lovely. Thank you very much uh, indeed there, Sarah uh, and the audit team. Um, I'll continue in, in, in sort of order. So, Councillor Eggington, uh, any questions or clarifications required? Sorry, I've got a dog. Oh, you can in. <laughs> we'll have to start off in a minute. Right. Keep quiet, please. The, the, um, the dog likes the plan, I think. Mm. <laughs> he hasn't looked at it. I, if, I'm keeping it away from him. Um, I think I was interested in, in one element, which was on page 110, the capital funding, <coughs> sorry, capital funding <coughs> for alcohol treatment. And there was suggestion there was no claim was there was no grant claim made and I, I was a bit surprised by that but anyway I mean, that's just an aside really um, the, the, in terms of um, yes on, on page 115 um, to one of the outstanding recommendations which which uh, I'm not it's perfectly it's fine, no worries. Shoot. We, we can come back to you if, if you want yeah, in, in, best. In, come back, in a minute. Come back to me. I'll okay, go. no trouble at all. Look, um, Councillor Graham. No, I've got nothing. Oh, nothing I'm sorry, just mix up the order, <laughs> just keep everyone on their toes. See, I've, I've, I've lost my stride now as well. Sorry, no, Councillor Graham. I can well appreciate the difficulty. I can appreciate the difficulties that uh, COVID has uh, brought upon everyone trying to get through a, a program like this. It's, uh, it's a good result, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Councillor Flynn, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just on Appendix D, um, I note the item on early years centres, mm -hmm. and I notice it sounds as though some progress is being fairly recent progress actually is being made there um, in terms of it refers to a service manager being appointed uh, in December uh, 2020 and some improvements being made on the initial uh, so the issues that have been identified previously. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered whether anyone is able to elaborate a little bit on that because it sounds like um, some potential good news on an issue that seems to have been a problem for some time based on this commentary. 
Um, sure, I can. Um, happy to. So with respect to the service manager, um, that's a real, really good positive move in the right direction. So that has helped to shape the service a lot more. And now with the um, new leader in place, there is a direction of travel of where they the services that they want to continue providing at the early year centre and how they want that service to move. I understand also that there are some promotional activities that are taking place um, that they plan to do for the relaunch um, in September. Um, and um, but I can I can go back to the corporate director and get some further information if you'd like us to present you with some some more information about how that uh, program is going to work. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see some further information on that. It's an important subject and it sounds as though some changes are being made. So uh, further information on that, I would uh, certainly welcome. No problem. Lovely. Thank you very much. Councillor Eggington. Uh, oh. Is harmony restored there? Well, the dog is out of the room, at least. He's howling in the background. Oh. Not to worry. Um, yes, can I, I, th there was one thing which was on page 103 to do with the three limited assurance opinions. Mm -hmm. And the questions I had really were, with regard to the cemeteries, bereavement service and ground maintenance review, there's reference made there to recommendations to support the services upgrade to a new IT system, good, improve record keeping, and then compliance with government legislation. Is it failing at the moment to, or had it been failing when you did the review to comply with government regulations? No, had it been failing, we would have given them no assurance. Um, but they, uh, they, 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 their working practices could be better. They're, um, because they're so paper-based, there's a lot of information that's scattered and a lot in storage, which um, hasn't been kept in the best of condition. So once they go through to, a, to an electronic system, there'll be a much safer and, and better way of storing information, which means if they're ever due for an inspection, they can show better compliance with the legislation. Thank you. And, and with regard to the education health and care plans mm -hmm. you, you refer there to recruitment and retention of staff as well as case load management i, I wondered um, what the issues were with recruitment and retention of staff was that in terms of the conditions of employment or um other issues I I believe the service has been going through a transformation change. So in the process, they've been using a lot of agency staff and also with COVID-19, I think resources have been moved elsewhere to support social workers. Um, so the use of agency staff has more come into more, uh, become more of a, an issue. And so they're, they're looking as they're part of doing part of the transformation work to employ more permanent staff so that they can uh, move the service ahead and forward. Um, but the recruitment exercise, I understand, is going quite well. We have very competitive rates. Social care are very good at checking market rates and using agencies to um, to make sure we offer the best deal for, for staff in, in social care. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a few questions as, as well, Sarah, uh, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, as well, I suppose, before the question, you know, congratulations uh, to you and the team. Um, you know, a good performance, I think, by the end of the, the year in the difficult circumstances that you've uh, all faced. So um, if you could pass on our thanks uh, we'll to do, the thank team you. Uh, for their hard work and uh, dedication uh, this year. Um, OK, um, three limited assurances. It's, it's a bit like buses in a way. We don't have um, too many of them and then they, they come along um, all at once. Um, do you think any of this is to do with changed controls and the change control environment in the pandemic situation that we're in? Or are they on the whole longer standing issues that would have resulted in a limited assurance if you'd done the audit a year ago, perhaps? I think it's more to do with the feedback that we've received both from audit committee and CMT in terms of making sure that we are risk focused and we don't just do reviews that uh, management want us to do because they like us to check things and we make um, valuable recommendations. I think it's definitely to do with the fact that there's a, a change within the team to make sure that we use resource in the best way and we give um, value by uh, by focusing on the highest risk areas in the organisation. So I foresee more kind of limited reviews, to okay. be honest, but I'm always going back to management and saying that's not um, a reflection of your service or, or, or staff. It's purely because it's risk focused and that's what we're um, and that's the, that's just the opinions that are likely to come out of these areas. Mm -hmm. 
but but these are areas where you know um you know sort of controls haven't eroded because of the pandemic are they long they're longer term That's issues correct. like the paperwork yes. and stuff yes like the, like the paperwork okay. and, and okay. yeah yeah Okay, uh, thank you for that. I just wanted to check. Um, no, three, three good, um, not good results, but three thorough audits by the looks of things with plenty for management to take uh, on board there. So um, good. Um, if I could ask a question uh, about pages 104, 105, uh, mm -hmm. if I may, uh, about the recommendations. And uh, thank you. This is um, you know, I found this interesting and useful, but I just wanted to check my, my understanding of, of one point, if I may. Um, the first table um, on page 104, uh, we've got um, uh, line one, number of recommendations that passed their implementation date. We've got 13 and 47. Mm -hmm. And then we've got additional recommendations in, in lines two, three and four, haven't we? Yes. In the blurb underneath, um, it says in the second sentence, out of those 11 high and nine medium risk recommendations of a revised implementation date. I think that out of those is wrong. Is, yes, is that correct? it needs to be in addition to, yes. So okay. that needs correcting, you're right. Just wanted to check that I got it, got it <laughs> yeah, right. I wasn't right. missing something. Okay. Um, my second qu clarification or question to clarify then is about the uh, KPI table um, on page 105. Um, KPIs three and four relate to recommendations um, and here we've got recommendations where um, the first I think KPI three is about high risk, um, KPI four is about medium risk mm -hmm. that, that um, have been actioned within the agreed time. H how does that KPI relate to what we're seeing in the table on the previous page? So in Appendix D, the um, KPI narrative uh, for KPIs three and four um, say that these are the 2021 high and medium risk recommendations that have fallen out of this reporting year. So um, they are okay. so. So in terms of the this everything 2021, within 2021 yes, is within yes, date. It's within that reporting year, um, and so far there have been uh, four medium risk recommendations that have been. Um, uh, have been uh, marked as uh, raised and implemented within 2021 um, and we've closed and verified those and the remaining recommendations are due in 21, 22 and 23 and again we'll be using those as our part of our follow-up work. Okay, okay. So the stuff oh, I'm sorry, Muir wants to... Muir has um, sorry, Muir. Yeah. Sorry, I was looking down at the papers, not at the screen. Oh, no, that's fine. Sorry, Jeremy. I, I think looking at it, looking at it now and I, we, obviously it's been been through me in review, but seeing it now, I can see actually that it does cause a little bit of confusion. confusion. Perhaps moving forward, because the table on the previous page refers to all recommendations, including previous years, perhaps the the bar chart on the, the next page needs to have a table that, that supports it in terms of number of recommendations raised within the year mm -hmm. within the KPI, because I can see there could be some confusion there. Mm -hmm. That, I think that would be helpful, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, no, and, but the explanation cleared it up nicely for me. Thank you. Um, I do have a, a question um, or two questions, really, if I may, on page 106, I think it is. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you, you mentioned in your briefing about bringing in additional resource to assist with the um, implementation of recommendations or the follow-up uh, of recommendations. Could you tell me a little bit more about what you're going to use the additional resource for uh, and the extent of any assistance to management? So the um, Internal Audit Apprentice recently completed their qualification oh, nice. um, and so their fixed term contract um, ended for the apprenticeship but following their qualification and because of their two years experience in the council we've asked them to stay on and assist um, with the follow-up work. Um, so the uh, they are um, so he is effectively a, a trained internal auditor whose main role um, will be to focus on the follow up exercise and to make sure that we get those numbers down from that table and work through all of the um, outstanding and due for recommendations at a high and medium risk in the council and to support the corporate directors and action owners with the implementation of those. Um, there, they also have responsibilities. Um, they can assist with auditors with other work as well, should they need to. But the majority or their focus for at least the first three months um, will be to assist us with the follow-up exercise. Okay, Muir. 
Yeah, just to build on what Sarah's saying there, essentially the role will be to verify because quite often um, management, uh, let's say the recommendation is you need to implement a new IT system to address the risk mm -hmm. and the IT system isn't going to be implemented for another six months. So the head of service says it's not been implemented in time. But actually the key point, it goes back to the essential Actually, inter what internal audit is about is not telling management what to do. It is highlighting to management there is a risk here that we think you need to treat. You need to address the risk. And here's a suggested recommendation. But actually, they could take alternative action, which could, which could still address the risk. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they misinterpret whether they have actually addressed the risk by taking action. So management would genuinely take action to do something. But whether it's addressed the risk or not, has, is, has it been successful? Has it been successful? And so essentially, the the internal auditor uh, Rohan, um, he will be verifying that the what management are saying has happened actually is in place, and the risk is being addressed. Because the key point is, has the risk been addressed? Not not has the internal order recommendation been implemented, it's has the risk been addressed? And, and essentially, that will be the key piece of work that they'll be doing. We hope in the next three months so by the time we come back to audit committee in july it'll be a much better picture but it might end up being a, a six month piece because there is there was so much pressure on back on management over the last previous 12 months that it has created a bit of a backlog on unimplemented recommendations again no sure thank you both very much um and, and just to clarify so it, if um this additional sort of you know work hadn't come up we were the apprentice would have moved on and left left the organization is that right potentially yes yeah potentially yeah, yeah. um on the we couldn't guarantee him a position uh on the last round of recruitment uh, obviously it was it, it was open uh to others uh to apply for roles as well so yeah but um we're, we're hoping that uh, through one through this piece of work that uh, actually it, it, you might might develop into something else. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, thank you uh, for that. Um, under paragraph five point four on the same page, the effectiveness of internal audit uh, review. Um, mm -hmm. You know this is is a good thing. Uh, I think it's important. But I note with interest. Um, that it's also included on the list of assurance pieces of work uh, in the plan itself. I don't mm -hmm. really see how it can be in both places, if you see what mm -hmm. I mean. Um, um, yeah, it doesn't I, feel like an audit, it feels like a standard no, task I, I, we should I'll, be doing. I think uh, I'll own that. that. That's probably, it's more a, a historical thing perhaps, but um, yeah, it's, it's something that's required annually, as you know, rather than actually being a an assurance review. It obviously gives. Uh, it gives assurance, but it assurance, it's not an assurance but review. It's, audit, yeah. But it's not an in, in, in assurance review. So we'll we'll redefine that before it comes to audit committee in July. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and in terms of the the future plan, uh, the other sort of question you set us um, in terms of you know, do we like the content of of the future plan? Uh, with the exception of the review of the effectiveness of internal audit, um, to my mind, I think it's a good, well-balanced plan looking at a number uh, of high-risk areas and a, uh, a, a good number of areas that would concern me in any organisation. So I'm very happy with um, the work that you've got down here uh, as a team. I think there's plenty to get your teeth stuck into, to be honest. Most definitely. Thank you, Chairman. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And uh, again, thanks to, for the performance over the previous year uh, to you uh, and to the team. Look, much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, and that brings us on to agenda item eight, which is sort of maybe a, sort of part of what you've spoken about it, it already and part of what I've just mentioned. But that is the draft internal audit plan for 2021-2022. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so this presentation refers to agenda item eight um, on pages 127 to 143 of your papers and presents the audit committee with the draft internal audit annual plan for 21-22 for approval. 
Um, it sets out the planned audit approach and activity type for the forthcoming financial year, setting out the risk-based co coverage for 21-22 to help inform the um, annual head of internal audit opinion, in addition to setting out the internal audit resources and their utilisation. Um, the plan traditionally is not very different from previous years. Uh, we continue to deliver internal audit work with the risk-based approach at the heart of everything we do. Um, I'll just draw your attention to a follow the following areas would have, uh, which have been slightly revised. Um, the follow-up process, which again has been has been updated and it, we still continue to deliver that um, in the 21-22 year. Um, and the team restructure and recruitment exercise has seen an increase in the number of days um, next year, which is now 1,100 compared to 850. Um, so the increase is primarily due to the change in the composition and skills mix of the internal audit team and the breakdown of how these resources are deployed um, is detailed on page 139 and appendix C of your papers. Um, and there's also an organisation chart on page 143, appendix F, um, for your information, which we've, we haven't included before. Um, but happy to answer any questions you might have about the plan. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Eggington, any, any is now a good moment. No questions. <laughs> um, no, I've got no questions. Actually, I, I think this is fine. This plan. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Councillor Flynn. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I concur with Councillor Eggington. No, no questions from me, uh, Mr. Chairman. Very happy with this uh, report. Thank you very much indeed. Last but never least, Councillor Graham. Yes, Chairman. Um, I'm looking at the heading role of internal audit. Uh, as a councillor, I, uh, I sometimes come across matters or areas that stand out as being poorly managed or inefficient. Um, how often are such examples, such examples uh, as these, which one hopes are recognised by the relevant senior management brought to the attention of uh, internal audit for expeditious review would be my question. So Councillor Graham, every quarter we have um, planning meetings with corporate directors and heads of service and senior managers um, and that feeds into the internal audit plan that we present to you every every quarter. Um, also Muir has a uh, regular meeting with uh, Councillor Goddard and the leader of the council as well, which he feeds back to me if there are any issues um, coming out of those. We also have access to um, finance senior management team meetings and Muir has access to um, bid review papers and transformation papers as well. So if there are, are any areas coming out of those and, and, and we prepare the risk register as well and all of that forms the basis of our of our audit universe which we then assess the risk in terms of um, which areas we should focus on in the plan and then we present that to um, CMT and audit committee for agreement um, to make sure that we're focusing on the the areas that require internal audits um, to review them. Right thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Chair. Thank you Councillor Graham. Um, Sarah, just a couple of, of um, questions from me. Page 130 in the very first paragraph, mm -hmm. you talk about working more closely with the council, council's sorry, business improvement team. Tell me a little bit about um, how that's going and where you envisage sort of working more closely. So every quarter we, um, I think, we, well, we try to make contact with them because they, they can be quite busy, but they, they have a, a programme of improving work. Improving things, probably. Improving things, in, in, indeed. Um, and we make contact with them as again as part of the quarterly planning process, but with myself and the um, the, the head of service for the bid team, um, they let us know about areas that they're working on, and they either ask for internal audit assistance or sometimes they ask for previous reviews that we've done in that area so that they can go back and use that um, as part of development for the, or transformation work of that area, and vice versa. We ask if there's any areas that they've come across which may not feature in their plan, but um, we, but they think would need re require some internal audit review or assistance. Um, and so we avoid that duplication um, whereby we have internal audit come in and then you have transformation or the big team come in. OK, OK. And that's working. One second. Oh, that's working fairly well in practice so far. So far, it's all done via teams um, at the moment. So, yeah. OK, well. sorry, Muir. No, it was just to add uh, uh, on top of what Sarah said, uh, I I speak to the head of transformation probably 
not quite every day, but on a regular basis. Uh, in my the other areas that I'm responsible for, Exchequer Services, um, we're developing artificial intelligence. We're going through robotic process automation, and so we're, the Exchequer Services team are working very closely with the transformation team. And through that, I have regular contact with the head of transformation. She gives me a heads up on what's on the radar as well. So I'll feed that back to Sarah mm -hmm. as and when is required. OK, lovely. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to see the, the 1100 uh, days um, available to to you and to the team. A, a whopping great 29% uh, increase, which, um, as you can imagine, de delights mm -hmm. me no end. Um, so very pleased to see uh, that in there. I think you've got the balance from my perspective uh, of different types of work you know, uh, as good as it can be, but, you know, certainly fit for purpose there. Um, so very pleased to see that as well. Um, I do have a, a little question on page 131 at the very top where you mentioned we carried out a review of team plans where they could be traced. Tell me a little bit more about how far planning goes down. We've spoken about risk management before, mm -hmm. but at what, how far down do you think planning should go? or indeed it does go uh, with, you know, within the areas that you're looking at here? We, because of because it's quite resource intensive, um, when carrying out the planning work and risk management work, uh, we tend to kind of tag team those. So they tend to be um, at a senior management level. Um, so we focus on the senior, senior management um, team plans uh, or service improvement plans. Um, we tend to find those quite well adapted um, in social care um, and within finance, um, but there could be areas of improvement. Operationally, we don't have the resource to go at an operational level. And um, in the past, we used to have a performance management tool, Excelsis, which sometimes used to record team plans, um, but um, we, we haven't used that system for a long time. Um, I suspect once um, we get back into the council and once we have a, a strategic plan with, with the new leader in place, mm -hmm. that that will that again that tone from the top will feed down to um, to CMT and then senior management and then operational level as well. Um, so I, I, I would hope then that would would help with the development of, of team plans. But in, in my experience, we haven't I've come across very many um, when I was when I was doing the risk management work myself. Okay, lovely. Thank you. One sort of final question. If I may, uh, and I'm able to give uh, a holistic annual opinion in your forthcoming annual report. Um, if, if, the, if yourself, Chairman, don't mind, I would like to hold off. Um, there okay. are still 11 reviews that still are outstanding and there's still that's still quite a chunk of, of uh, reviews to, to go through. So I would I would like to hold off at that this stage if that's okay. Wait and see what happens until mm -hmm. till then. OK, that's yes, that's prudent. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for including this structure chart. I think that is useful for us. It's something that we I think have asked for um, previously. It's good to see sort of once a year where the structure of the team uh, is and your content for the time being that you've got the resources here and the right structure to deliver the work you're planning to do. I am very, months. very, very pleased with how the recruit recent recruitment exercise has gone. And um, despite the challenges with COVID and how we're having to induct staff for, in a remote way, um, it's it's been going on, really, it's been doing really, really well. And that's credit to the team and also to the council as a whole for accommodating us. Lovely. OK, th thank you very much, Sarah. That, that, that's great. Um, and um, and thank you uh, for, for the presentations this afternoon, this evening. Much appreciated. Um, agenda item uh, 9, 2021, sorry, 2020-2021 Q4 counter fraud progress report. And for the final time, um, nice to see you, Zach, and thank you for interrupting your holiday to attend uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. That's not a problem at all. Um, so, yeah, this is the quarter four counter fraud progress report and um, obviously the final one for the year. And it's, uh, it's safe to say that um, the counter fraud operations were re uh, well, there were more challenging conditions than in quarter three um, with the restrictions that were imposed again by the government, which did affect our operations. But 
at the same time where they were less affected than the initial first lockdown last year, meaning that we have been able to deliver um, 262,000 um, in loss prevention savings for this quarter, um, which by the slimmest of margins brings us over the 1 million target for the year, which obviously I would have liked to have been more substantial, um, but but essentially uh, uh, it means obviously that the target was right and uh, we have met it for for this were you year. Emptying out the piggy banks, <laughs> were you, of the a children and such a like? Absolutely, yeah, yes. Yeah. But um, essentially, you'll see that breakdown in Appendix B um, of of the report. Um, but I think this does represent a significant achievement for the team, uh, given the year that we have had. Um, and uh, yes, the, I, I feel that the team has re really delivered on its uh, its counter fraud uh, agenda for the year. Um, just in terms of the detail of that, we've we've obviously had to continue our work with Exchequer Services on the grants pre-assurance checks, which means that we have been providing um, assurance over those payments of grants um, to to the government. Um, and there have been pre and post assurance checks done on on grant payments, um, and they will continue for the the time being whilst that um, program is in place. Um, and and the team is still um, putting in considerable resource into that area. Um, in terms of other areas of counter fraud work, uh, within housing this quarter, we delivered 11 properties back to the council. Um, and that that brings the total to the year to 22, which, again, I think it's a good, good uh, performance of the team um, when considering that in 1920, we, de we delivered 28. So I think uh, given everything that's going on with the courts and the, uh, the the restrictions on the recovery of property through the courts, which again is impeded by the government legislation and um, the the way in which we can recover properties. I think that's a good performance. Um, but that's been achieved largely through flexible approaches to, to um, recovery of properties, such as negotiations, just like rather than actually taking people to court, which um, I think is a good thing. Um, in uh, Exchequer Services this quarter, we've achieved a total of 26,000 in loss prevention savings, uh, which, which for the year is 138,000. Um, that is attributable to quite a lot of beds and sheds work, which, which we've been doing throughout the year in terms of projects, and that's been more proactive than reactive. Um, and I think, again, that, that's, that's an area that we will continue to focus on for, for moving forward. But um, in terms of NFI, that's obviously an area that we are still covering for, for the council, um, such as things in, in council tax and single person discounts and so on. Um, in the area of social care, which we have been trying to focus on more, there, I'm not able to report more savings for this quarter, um, meaning that the total for the year is still 130,000. But I think it's fair to say that um, we have been doing um, a lot of work still in this area with um, a significant number of investigations still ongoing now um, and I think that's reflective of the work uh, on engaging with managers and, and, and staff alike on fraud awareness and um, we're receiving many more referrals from that area of the council and we hope that that will obviously translate into um, some good uh, performance outcomes um, for the council um, in quarter one of next year. Um, so Something I have done in, in quarter four is met with directors and heads of service looking at uh, fraud risk planning. Um, and this will obviously be reflected in the, the next agenda item in terms of the counter fraud strategic plan. But that's um, an area that we focused on for this quarter. Um, and things such as like looking at new areas and, and discussing with the head, the new head of procurement in terms of what we can do there and proactive work, looking at our procurement processes and whether we can add value by doing some proactive um, projects work um, with with managers in that areas. And also um, looking at other areas such as the financial assessments, verification processes within there to help give more assurance over um, social care payments and so on. So that that's obviously part of our risk-based approach to counter fraud work, which which, which we're continuing to to develop and improve on. Um, but uh, that's that's something obviously that we will hope to continue forward um, into the new year. And my uh, new interim head will will obviously continue with um, moving forward too. Um, just a couple of things to point out to to the committee is that on in revenues inspections we have 
delivered uh, just over 6,000 inspections for the year. Um, and performance in this area is improved on the last three quarters, which is something that we have been looking at, um, which I think is a really good outcome considering how things have been. And that actually means more inspections done this year than last year, interestingly. Um, <clears throat> and um, one other point to note is uh, the immigration enforcement officer that we had um, embedded within the team. We have had to reduce um, the number of hours that we receive in service from the Home Office to do with the uh, reduction in uh, referrals that we're receiving from the council and reduction in work that the immigration officer is getting. Um, we think this is reflective of the, the COVID situation and um, symptomatic of staff being or not being within the civic and having sort of um, the, the visibility of the officer because he would be going around speaking to, to members of staff and have much more engagement that way. And we have done some pieces of work on improving visibility and getting communications out to the council, but we thought it was prudent to reduce those hours. And But it does, uh, we have discussed this with the Home Office and we can in, in, uh, increase hours if necessary, should things uh, improve in future. Um, on the KPIs front, um, I think it's fair to say we have improved on quarter three generally with six being in the green uh, uh, zone with one red and one yellow. The red one was with to do with sanctions, which um, is reflective of, of the court situation. We're not prosecuting cases. We're not sanctioning cases. Um, it's very difficult for us to do that now, considering what the courts are prioritising. Um, and the yellow one was on inspections in terms of our 10 day target. But that in con within context is a significant improvement at 84 percent than around the 59 percent. I think it was that we achieved in quarter three. Um, I, I think what I'll do at this point is hand over to Alex to give you a bit of a, a, a forward look um, and obviously let him introduce well, introduce you. Alex, rather, sorry, to, to the committee. Um, so An Alex is the interim head of counter fraud um, uh, at the moment. And uh, yeah, he's going to talk you through some summary points on the forward look. Lovely. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome, Alex. Um, congratulations on taking up uh, the role and um, obviously good, good luck in it. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to take the committee through the forward look into quarter one, uh, which starts on pages 154 of the electronic pack. The team will continue to alter operational activity uh, to meet COVID-19 restrictions, although as we move forward through the government roadmap, restrictions will begin to have less of an impact on the service. Uh, visiting and interviewing functions are continuing for most cases where appropriate. Okay. Uh, the team will continue to support Exchequer services in the administration of business grants which will include providing pre and post assurance checks to ensure eligibility. The work will continue through quarter one and possibly beyond. The team currently uh, in the planning stages for three proactive projects uh, across the areas of housing, social care and revenues. Uh, I'll be able to update the committee in July on how these projects are going. Uh, after consultation with Muir and Paul, uh, a financial target for 21-22 has been set at 1.5 million pounds. Uh, I am confident this will be able to be achieved and uh, currently we already have some positive savings on the board for quarter one. Um, as the previous you are, head was a bit too cautious when it came to savings targets and things. <laughs> maybe so chairman, maybe so. Um, as you're all aware unfortunately Zach is leaving us at the end of this week and there are interim arrangements within the, the management team. Uh, this will continue through quarter one and a permanent decision will be made during quarter two. Uh, thank you for listening and I'll pass back over to Zach. Uh, yeah, and I'll just invite any questions after that excellent forward look. Lovely. Thank you both very much uh, indeed. Um, colleagues, Councillor Eginton, any questions or points to clarify here? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, no, I think uh, it's bearing in mind the circumstances, it's a very laudable performance for not only the quarter, but for the last year. Um, hopefully it is a, a basis on which to go forward and uh, achieve even more in the coming quarters. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I don't have anything further to add to what 
hasn't been said already, but thank you to those involved in uh, producing this report and uh, for their hard work on this subject. Thank you. Councillor Graham. Well, uh, I would just endorse what's been said and say that uh, I, I think it's been an excellent uh, year's work. Very good, uh, very good progress. And uh, I wish Alex the best. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Lovely. Um, Zach, uh, I suppose um, a flexible approach taken in negotiating with tenants. Um, I can imagine the sort of standing sort of nearby saying you want to surrender the property. Um, obviously, it's been fairly successful. Yes, um, I, I think a flexible approach is kind of a it's a roundabout way of saying that we've been discussing the merits of returning tenancies with tenants um, in, in far more um, a uh, well protracted manner than we would have necessarily have attempted before rather before going to court. So I think there are lessons to be learned from that in terms of how we approach things in future, because of I course, wondered, yeah, I wonder whether there may be. Yeah, because court action is obviously quite expensive and uh, it can be uh, quite uh, well protracted and last well, last a long time. And, and it takes, you know, take it takes up a lot of resources to get properties back. However, it is sometimes necessary, yeah. but I think what we have to do is to look at it and say, well, given the fact that we achieved 22 this year, when last year we achieved 28 with the approaches that we've taken this year, um, there are some lessons that we need to, to learn from that and to take a bit more of a mixed approach to uh, re recovery of properties. Um, there will always be times when we need to go to court, but I think we can try to get properties back through a more a less you know legislative or litigious litig I can't Litig the word. yeah it's one of those horrible words litigious I think yeah that's the one um that that sort of approach which we don't necessarily need to take all of the time um I think it another factor in that which is probably um to note is that we have had a uh, the the housing investigations unit in place for for some time now and I think that has with, with that the housing investigations council fraud manager um, in place. I think their approach has has been uh, quite uh, successful in this, with them being very experienced in this area and able to be, you know, quite targeted um, in, you know, which properties we take to court, which properties we negotiate, and yeah, and I, and I think we'll we'll continue that, and I think it's going to be very successful um, moving forward as well. Okay, lovely. Um and this is probably a foolish question, but where we stop short of um, legal action uh, and, and courts, a record still flagged so that we're alert to maybe some of these individuals um, in the future. I see Alex nodding. Do you want to take this one, Alex? Yeah. Um, yes, Chairman, they are. We obviously have a, an intelligence database where we keep records of anyone that is been under investigation. We also um, put markers on the necessary files within the service areas so that they are alert to what has happened okay. in the past as well as ourselves. Lovely. OK, um, I assume that was the case, but I should never assume anything much. But uh, that, that's great. Thank you. That reassures me. Um, and uh, a good performance, gentlemen, um, in respect to the KPIs, as you said, um, you know, Q4, much more green than it was uh, in earlier quarters. I know that overall over the, the year, you know, there's a bit more red than there, there was in, in our previous year. Uh, and I know it's not kind of the, the figures that you would want to see, but it's been a somewhat exceptional year, uh, as we all know. And I'll echo what my committee colleagues have said, you know, big well done to, to you all uh, as well uh, for the hard work that you too ha have all put in. And uh, good to see you just squeaking over the line that um, I think at our last committee mem meeting you were confident of achieving. I, I was chair I and uh, I'm happy that we uh, achieved it even if it is a slim margin we obviously did the right amount of work to get it yeah yeah and no more you know what's the point of wasted effort you know <laughs> no thank you very much and um, you know good luck in the new role uh, Zach obviously uh, as we said last time um, and um, good luck Alex um, in, in taking over the role uh, for the next few months at least so uh, thank you both very much indeed um, Okay.
so we have um uh, you know the, the follow-on really uh, we, we've had the sort of short-term focus look now we've got the the strategic look with agenda item 10 the draft counter fraud strategic plan for 21 to 22. thank you chair um this is the strategic uh, the counter fraud strategic plan starting on page 159 of your packs and in summary it describes how the counter fraud the business insurance counter fraud team will deliver our counter fraud services across of 21 and 22 um, and the key points i think to mention about this strategy is that it's essentially there are some minor adjustments in terms of the overall strategy from 20 uh, from uh, 2021 um, in and the main ones have been within the risk assessment, um, which I'll mention when it comes. Uh, I think that's in appendix um, appendix A of the pack. Um, in terms of the strategic aims, it's just to reiterate what um, Alex said. We have obviously settled on a 1.5 million target, which I think is reasonable to um, considering where we are and where we might expect to be um, within 21 and 22. Um, but essentially what we are aiming to do is to continue to develop and maintain our professional and and an effective counter fraud service which is which is risk based and um, focuses on what the um, what the council considers to be its most significant risks of fraud so um just to keep some of the key points about the, the the strategic aims is obviously to provide that deterrent to fraud and corruption through uh, a robust investigations and prosecutions process. Um, but I personally think that this is one part of a larger strategy which has to involve many other area, many other key activities such as engagement with um, within the council, um, ensuring that we work in partnership with our colleagues. Um, but also um, embedding a, a very strong uh, culture of fraud awareness and and an awareness of fraud risk within management and, and an understanding of what's required in order to to prevent it um, or, or to, to you know to prevent um, fraud risks from becoming a problem for the council. Um, we obviously want to um, work with our colleagues in internal audit and and risk on the, the governance arrangements for 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 counter fraud. Um, and we're, what we are doing now um, is having a um, we're setting up a a quarterly, I believe it is, um, liaison meeting between the service areas to to ensure that our planning and our and our focus is is um, collectively um, structured and 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 that we're 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 working all to this to um, the same um, understanding. Him she. That's, that's it. And so on. So um, we also want to make sure that we properly um, have an eye on what uh, what we're doing to innovate and modernise within counter fraud, and we're always making sure that we keep abreast of any developments that we can use to enhance counter fraud work, such as data, using data effectively, um, and need tools uh, as well. So that that's part of our strategy as well to 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 use um, technology where we can. In terms of our risk assessment, as I said, this was. Um, this was fed into by the work that I did this quarter with Alex, um, with heads of service and directors, looking at our key fraud risks and discussions we had um, in the areas of procurement, social housing, revenue, social care. Um, and we also um, got, have talked to schools and, and schools leaders as well about fraud risks. So, so that's, that's detailed in Appendix A, and that feeds into our operational plan, which is in Appendix B. And um, considering this is something that uh, Alex is going to be working on this year, what I'll do is that I'll again, I'll hand over to Alex to, to give you a summary of the key points of the operational plan for 21 and 22. Okay. Thanks, Zach. The counter fraud team operational work plan can be found on page 171 of the electronic packs. I'd just like to take you through some of the key and new areas within the plan. Uh, the team will also will continue to focus uh, on investigating matters of relating to tenancy fraud. Um, this will now be accompanied by um, some new projects that will be introduced this year. The first being a, a housing key fob data review. The team will uh, utilise council data and analyse this data to identify any subletting or non-occupation. 
The housing heat amnesty uh, is something completely new uh, for Hillingdon, uh, whereby we will be running uh, an amnesty in a period of time where anyone within a council tenancy or an emergency accommodation can hand their keys back uh, with no repercussions. Uh, the council offers uh, lots of different forms of emergency accommodation across B&B, temporary accommodation and social care with section 17. The team will continue to provide uh, residency checks on all three of these areas to identify any sublet and non-occupation so that these properties can be relet. The team of over the last uh, six months has worked very, very closely, uh, as Zach has already said, with social services. Um, part of that has been within financial assessments. We now have a uh, referral process that is in place and uh, I'm also pleased to report as of quarter one, we actually have a high level verification process that is in place. Um, this will mean the counter fraud now verifies um, any applicant that applies via the financial assessment process. Um, and we're also looking to be involved in the annual review and identify any loss prevention savings uh, later on in the year. We will continue to obviously uh, focus on NFI matches. New matches have been available since the start of uh, quarter four, and that will take us throughout the rest of the financial year. Beds and sheds, uh, as last year, will continue uh, throughout the year. Uh, I think there'll be more of a steady programme we will see this year, um, and hopefully we will see improvements on, on last year's outcomes. Uh, something new uh, for the, the work plan is procurement. As Zach has already said, we've had discussions uh, with the new Head of Procurement and Commissioning. The plan is to deliver some form of fraud awareness training uh, to procurement officers uh, and have a dialogue about a new referral process so that things can be passed over to ourselves. Uh, and also potentially uh, a review and assessment of the Council's exposure to, uh, to procurement fraud risks may be picked up later in the year. And I'll be having discussions with the Head of Procurement um, probably at the end of quarter one, start of quarter two. The grant work will continue to uh, feature within the work plan, um, certainly for quarter one, possibly into quarter two, with us providing pre and post assurance checks and also support the recovery function of any grants where um, that were people weren't eligible for. Something else that is also new to the plan is maintain schools, as Zach has already uh, said that we have had discussions with different heads within education within the, uh, the council. Um, we're looking to put together a program for fraud awareness for maintained schools, uh, focusing around potential fraud risks and uh, you know, introducing and building on a robust control environment. Um, this will be followed up with a toolkit, uh, which we will be designing and distributed to all heads within schools, just to pr promote sort of good practices and good governments. Um, something else that we've always continued to do, but it's now featuring on the work plan, is our fraud awareness and engagement. Um, it's definitely in the last six, quarter three and quarter four, I've seen us ramp up our growth program. We've delivered um, a lot more and promoted, obviously, a, a counter fraud culture within the organisation. This will continue throughout the year. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we've already got two fraud awareness sessions booked in for April alone. Um, thank you for listening and I'll pass back over to Zach. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um yeah, and that, so that's the cancer fraud strategy and operational work plan. And uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions that the committee has. OK, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Eginton, any questions? Um, not particularly. It, I mean, the, the comment I would make, it, it would be useful to, to identify or at least have some sort of targets for the number of investigations within each of these headings. So to, to give us an idea of of how things are going because at the moment we've got the details for 2021 but of course that's a bit uh, we would expect that to be very low in most cases anyway so it would be useful to know what sort of targets would okay. be possible okay i can see muir has got his hand up yes there. <laughs> i think i think the challenge with that is sometimes when you you commence an investigation you don't know if it will take five days or I've been involved in investigations that have taken a year and a half. So it, it is quite difficult to, uh, we, you know, I, I do know what you're saying, but it, it, in terms of, uh, if we were to say, we've got a target of five investigations uh, in a particular area, and one of them takes a very long time, 
then we'll never get onto the even the second one. So it, it's quite challenging to have targets for investigations in the same way where we've tried to have the synergy between internal audit and counter fraud. Internal audit, the complete timesheets, they're given a budget. So if you're doing a debtor's audit, you might be given 15 days to do that debtor's audit. We've tried to do a similar thing in counter fraud, but it's actually quite difficult to say, you've only got 15 days to complete that investigation, when actually it could be a six month investigation that's required. So I do know what you're saying. It might be worth uh, Alex and I exploring uh, to see what options are, there are out there for targets. Yeah, I, mean, I was thinking that perhaps the beds in sheds, for example, you could have a target there. Um, and so, certain of the others, I'm, I, I appreciate that it is difficult, but at least it would be something, I think. Can I can I just say um, to, to that counter Eggington that um, I, I yes, I take your point and I think it would be useful to 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 have some sort of idea of what volume of work that we might do give, given in, in any given area. And I think that's maybe how it could be done is to, to look at what what volumes of work we might expect um, for for a particular area. And, and then we can sort of report on that because I because I understand where you're coming from when we look at it. It sort of looks if we do. We, we look to focus on these individual areas, but we don't necessarily specify how much we're going to do within those areas. And we've tried to structure the team with what we expect we might be a highest volume volumes of work, given which what how many um, FTEs we have in each individual uh, investigations unit. But maybe the, the t Alex and you know, moving forward can do that to, to sort of talk about volumes we might expect and report that to committee. Yes, yes I, I appreciate it's a bit of a challenge, certainly. I I think earlier in the agenda, we've already said that um, for revenue inspections, we've managed to achieve, I think it was 6,000 for 2021. So maybe that's that's the type of area where we could give a, a, a target. Um, yeah, some may be easier and more intuitive to do than others. And, you know, I think we'd all appreciate it could be a little bit of a sort of finger in the air, but it, it, it may be useful just to. Thank you. Councillor Flynn. Yeah, no, I'm again. I'm. Okay. I don't sound too repetitive, but I'm fine with this. Uh, this report, no issues. Lovely. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, and Councillor Graham. Yes, Chairman. Um, uh, on the top of page one six seven, uh, item five three, it mentions among other, among other things lines of communication available to risk as a means of raising concerns about fraud and corruption. Uh, actually, I would like to see this aspect better advertised as far as members of the public are concerned, but I appreciate it would be a question of how. Um, hitting them people, perhaps? I don't know. I'd like to have a comment on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry, Zach. Um, Zach or Alex, I can see Alex's hand up as well. Um, I'll, 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 uh, I'll I'll let Alex obviously come in if there's anything that, that I've missed, but we do. Um, this is one area that we do obviously try to do, um, try to get out to the public as much as possible in terms of giving them lines of communication with us. We do have the fraud hotline and we do have the um, the uh, email address which we um, advertise to the public um, through things like social media and Twitter. Um, Hillingdon people. Um, is something which we have in the past um, and I believe that there is information that goes out in within healing people although I'm not entirely certain what it currently is that goes out within that um, but essentially we, we we have tried to do it more through social media as well yeah. um, to get information That's out such as Twitter and the council's um, Facebook page um, but I, but I think um, and the council's website as well has information on how to refer I think there is proactive work that could be done in this area and, and again it's 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 a case of how much resource do we put into it in, in order to to get the mes meshes out but i but i'm of the opinion that we we could potentially do more um but but it's what we do how we do it so that we're maximizing the the, the re response from the public um and things like a key amnesty for instance on housing fraud is something which will raise awareness of housing fraud within the public and generate referrals as well so that's one area that we can can um, um, improve um, our income of referrals from as well from the public but I'll let Alex um, you know 
come in if there's anything that you wanted to add to that. Um, no, nothing to add, Zach. You've kind of um, went through what, what I was going to suggest. I just wanted to say to Councillor Graham, I'll take his, uh, obviously his question on board uh, during quarter one um, and how we obviously li liaise with the public during our fraud awareness. Lovely. Thank you very much. Just two very quick observations uh, from me. Um, you mentioned about um, liaison between the fraud arm and the internal audit arm, um, you know, leaping out from um, the strategy and from the planned work to my mind is the area of procurement, as as you mentioned. And uh, also within procurement, you've got um, contract management as one of the, the, the bullet points in, in the strategy. That feels to me, based upon some of the audit work that that internal audit will be doing in Q1, a, a good area to, to share this sort of experiences and concerns over perhaps what you both find during the course of your respective uh, roles, I guess. Yeah, ab absolutely. Sorry. No, I mean, you know, it's a statement more than anything. I think there's plenty of opportunity there to, to share um, hints and tips and good practices between you, you, you both sides there. Um, the other bit I did just want to, to mention um, in passing, um, I think fraud awareness is really, really important. So I'm pleased to see that given a, a, a priority. Um, I think the work that you're intending to do around maintained schools and uh, perhaps a toolkit there that you can design once and then roll out to a number of school, schools feels like a, a really efficient way uh, of working there. So really pleased to see that. The key amnesty is just the one that kind of interests me a little bit. Uh, in particular. Um, ha have you seen evidence of this working in other boroughs? Yes, Chair, we've, we've, it's something that we have researched um, and looked into in terms of other boroughs doing this, and it does seem that um, it, it can be an effective tool for um, recovery of properties with the least amount of effort on our part, um, which of course is a good thing. Um, so it, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know, Alex, if you have more information on which boroughs we've canvassed, maybe you can come in on that. But uh, but essentially, there there are a number of boroughs that we we have that the housing investigations manager particularly has um, engaged with directly on key amnesties, how it's done, how they make the arrangements to do it, and what the expected results can be. But I think it does look a, a very positive thing um, that we could try, and at the very least, it it is a it is a small piece of work for us to do, which might have some very good um, outcomes for the council. Is that fair to say, Alex? Uh, I don't uh, know. Yeah, we, no. Sorry, Alex. I don't know that we necessarily need to name other boroughs that have tried it. But what, what yeah. we do know, Chairman, is that it has worked at, at other authorities. Yeah, that, that that was my question. The gist yeah. of my question, really. Uh, of course, it's not going to it's not going to identify. All of the, so it, for some people, the the fear of being prosecuted would prevent them coming forward. So the fact that we say there will be no uh, repercussions if you ha hand the keys back, that will that will generate some quick wins. But it's it's not going to be the only uh, approach that we no, take. It's, it's it's one of the tools in the toolbox, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new it's a new new one on, on us that mm. we will try. And it, it may not produce much of a result. And if not, then there's not a lot of effort going into it to generate what could be some positive results. But if, if, it, if it does work, then actually, yeah, we, we'll look at, see if we can roll it out a, a little bit wider in our approach. OK. Thanks. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, very happy with that and good luck in the, in, in the year ahead. Uh, Alex in particular. Uh, you too, Zach. Jeff. Thanks, Zach. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I won't repeat all the lovely words that I said last time, but um, best of luck in the new role uh, and in the, the new part of the world uh, up there in the far north. Um, all the very, very best. Um, agenda item uh, 11 then, um, conscious of the time, we have the Audit Committee Member Skills Matrix. Uh, who's going to talk us through this one? Steve? Uh, I believe Mia, uh, Mia will be um, talking through oh, this Oh, sorry, one. forgive me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Well, very, very briefly, because I'm conscious of time, what we've done is we've taken on board Audit Committee members' uh, feedback, We've uh, consulted with all the key officers 
and we've produced this draft skills matrix for audit committee members. If met audit committee are in agreement, we will use this for audit committee members to complete over the course of the next couple of months, and that will help identify the training and development program that we either have for individual members or members as a, a collective group, uh, and we'll do it in a rolling program going forward. So it's really just for members to, to say whether they're in agreement to what's included or not. Lovely, thank you very much. Councillor Edgington. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm, I'm very much in agreement with it. Um, the one area which I don't think it covers is the pension fund accounts. Um, and of course, we affect, well, we actually look uh, at Only those. in the last section. Uh, in, I think there is a little. Yeah, it's just in the last section. Yeah, yeah rather yeah, so rather than having a separate session on just purely pensions, what we thought we would do is, is part of the financial reporting uh, session in, in touch on pensions there rather than go because it i'm just i'm just conscious that the audit com committee doesn't want to go into the remit of what is the pensions committee um i, I, I mean maybe james would like to add a little bit more on that but in terms of a tra training session on what's the role of the audit committee in relation to the statement of accounts particularly the pensions element it's how long a session training session do audit committee members want on that as part of their role within the audit committee. Yeah, yeah, enough, James, I uh, James. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, you and I discussed this and we thought actually from from an audit committee's perspective, um, the financial reporting is incorporates the council's accounts and the pension fund accounts. So we could sort of pick up the high level information from the pension fund. If f as a separate exercise, um, Councillor Eggington, um, pensions committee want a special session on uh, the accounts then we can do that for pensions committee and perhaps sort of do a bespoke training session just for pensions committee on the pension fund accounts if that's um, potentially a way forward but in terms of the financial reporting it will be included the pension fund will be included in that financial reporting as well okay thanks okay. councillor flynn Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, can I just um, say uh, thank you to Muir and others who have produced this. Um, it's very much appreciated. This is a committee that, although uh, those councillors who currently sit on it uh, have, I think it's fair to say, more financial experience than the man on the Clapham omnibus, uh, and I know obviously uh, Councillor Eggington uh, has quite a bit of professional experience in uh, matters that are relevant to this committee. Uh, it doesn't uh, um, prevent a situation where this is a committee that is fairly technical uh, by the standards of uh, some of the other committees on the council. And who knows, we may have different councillors joining the committee in the future. So I think this is a good grounding for those people who may join the committee in the future who may not necessarily have uh, as much technical knowledge uh, as some other members uh, who have sat on this committee for uh, a number of years and i think it will serve uh, the members well who join the committee uh, and allow them to get up to speed with some of the issues which uh, are obviously fundamental to the work that this committee does Lovely, thank you very much, Councillor Flynn. Uh, Councillor Eggington. Yeah, I'm j just coming back on, on the point which uh, Councillor Flynn has mentioned. Um, the importance of training, mm -hmm. I hope that it would extend to the substitutes as well, because there will be other councillors who would substitute for us. Um, Councillor Dillon, for example, is my substitute. So it's important that any training and also this um, questionnaire should also go to, to the substitutes, please. Uh, I, I don't have any particular concerns with that. Muir, it, it looked like you were about to say something. No, I, I just thought it's yeah. going to be such interesting training. It should be probably rolled out wider across, <laughs> across the whole castle, shouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, well, I, I, I would absolutely well, to accounts that, That's an accountant speaking, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, sorry, Councillor Flynn. Sorry, I was just going to say, Chair, um, I would totally concur with what Councillor Eggington said there. Uh, I agree that substitute members should be uh, also uh, invited. invited to do the training as well. Lovely. I think that, that we'll take that as the way forward. Then, Councillor Graham, were you happy with the content of the uh, matrix? Yes, I'm, I'm happy with it and I'm happy with the comments. And it ticks all the boxes as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Lovely. OK, um, so if we can get that issued out, we will then complete it. If we could have it extended on to substitutes too, uh, then we can work up the, the, the training programme. Lovely. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, agenda item 12, the Audit Committee Forward Programme for 21-22. Sorry, Chairman. Yeah, this one is just a note for committee members. Yeah. Uh, if there's any comments from members or, or anybody involved. OK. Um, any any comments? Councillor Eggington. Yeah, so I, I think some of the dates um, have changed, are, I think. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not quite right. Um, I'm assuming that on page 185 of the September 2021 meeting, we'll be looking at the annual report of the Audit Committee for 2021, hopefully, rather than last year. Um, and some of the others, it should be 2021 rather than 21-22, I think. That's the July meeting. OK, so it might be worth a, a, a quick yeah, trot just, through just it's nothing uh, much updating, yeah. significant. Yeah, yes, the, the annual report of the Audit Committee 2020-2021 will come to the September Audit yeah. Committee. Yeah. Um, it, it, uh, just to highlight that the July meeting then will be the plan is to, for it to be on site. Yeah. On site, OK. Is, is that One right, other thing. Is that right, Steve? Sorry. Yes, so from the 6th of May, that's when the government legislation providing virtual meetings will end formally. Um, members will be asked to uh, come onto site. That at the moment that won't extend to all officers as well, but there will be an internal decision to be made. But anybody making decisions is by law required to be on site and, and present at the meeting. Lovely. Councillor Eggington. Yeah, one other thing which um, I noticed was missing, and that is the accounts of Hillingdon First Limited. I wonder whether we were going to see those and approve those before they're signed off by the directors. Have we ever seen those before? Well, I don't think they've been material in the past. The, the, the 2019 accounts, 2020 accounts, I mean, um, showed a small deficit of kind of a few hundred, a hundred thousand pounds of expenses which have been incurred but clearly I imagine the 2021 accounts will be slightly more material it's quite a lot of money has gone through it and although it may not be consolidated nevertheless it's uh, I would have thought it should at least come to audit committee do we have any any views on that because I don't know the the answer I must admit uh, James or no. Paul um, I would need to go away and find out if it's yeah. a requirement for it to come to um, audit committee. So I'm not sure off the top of my head either. OK, if, yeah, if, if, if you could take an action to, to find out and uh, maybe Steve, if you could send the answer around uh, to us um, when, it, when we have it. OK, thank you, Councillor Eggington. Um, OK, I think we're moving now into part two uh, of the agenda. So the end of part uh, one, we now move to part two of the meeting. Um, so can I please ask that the committee and officers remain on uh, whilst the live stream to YouTube is cut? Thank you all for watching.